So, welcome to the Render Script talk. I'm Chet Haas. And I'm Romain Guy. And, and we, we are. Go ahead. Both Your turn. We'll do it at the same time. Okay. We are on, we're on the UI that. Toolkit team uh, working on Android future versions um, as well as last minute presentations. Uh, we basically both do graphics and animation and UI related stuff. Oh, and yeah, and the reason why uh, we are qualified to talk about RenderScript is I spend a lot of time using RenderScript since Android 2.0. I went through the hell of the first versions. Uh, I, helped shape, I helped shape the APIs, uh, and Chad just felt like it. Um, yeah, so that's why he's talking about it. Pretty much why I do everything. Uh, yeah, we are not actually on the team that does RenderScript. We are on, we're sort of a consumer of RenderScript. We use it for some of the UI stuff that we do, and we're also graphics geeks. Um, but uh, one of the guys that, that's primarily a developer of RenderScript is Jason Sams. He wrote a couple of articles. I have links uh, later in the presentation about that. Um, so on with the show, whatever it is. Uh, this is the agenda. We'll get into the agenda. We don't need to go over the agenda slide. OK, so first, some overview stuff. Um, Actually, how many people have taken a look at RenderScript already? OK, so roughly half. -ish. That is impressive and scary. <laughs> uh, it is. I, I think it, it's a really powerful thing, and it's actually been used by the platform for a couple of releases back to 2.1 already. Um, so it's not like it's just this brand new thing. However, the documentation is pretty slim. I realized as I was writing some of the demo stuff uh, leading up to the talk that actually having a talk is probably a pretty good idea because it's kind of hard to, to piece together. I'd say the, the best thing you can do right now is take a look at the um, SDK side APIs and the sample code. Um, that's how you're going to learn it right now, and we're working on the docs really, really hard. Yeah, and not just the sample code, but um, uh, all the live wallpapers that we wrote for Android 2.0, 2.1 uh, were written with RenderScript, so they're really good examples of very complex scripts. Uh, we won't be able to go through uh, an example as complex as one of our live wallpapers here, uh, but once you understand the basics, uh, you will be able to go read those examples and understand what exactly they do. Uh, yeah, in fact, the code for those, those were a lot harder than they would be if rewritten today because they've written a lot of utilities on top of the core functionality of RenderScript uh, to make a lot of the boilerplate of writing RenderScript um, code easier. So anyway, RenderScript is, for the people that haven't touched it and have no idea why they're here, uh, it's a new language. It's also a compiler. Um, it's actually two compilers, uh, and it's a runtime. Uh, and the basic purpose of, of RenderScript is for performing fast rendering. Uh, 2D and 3D rendering functionality as well as computation. So it's got a rendering side and it's got a compute side. Um, and one of the ways that you can think about this is you can have the speed of native applications. So if you're used to doing NDK applications or native applications on other platforms um, and maybe you're thinking, well, I don't know if, if uh, SDK is appropriate because maybe there's extra overhead of you know, VM and GC and stuff like that. Well, you've got the performance of a native application um, but you've also got the portability of an SDK application. So and you don't have to deal with JNI. Uh, how many of you have ever written JNI code? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I spent the past eight months of my life pretty much writing JNI code, and I really wanted to die at some point. Uh, uh, so the, the portability thing comes in if you think about like writing an NDK application, you're basically compiling it for a target architecture, which is really awesome if that's the only architecture that the platform ships on, but that's not. Right? So we have primary architectures, but if a new one comes out, maybe your application is not going to work there. So NDK is specific to whatever you build for. Well, what you really want and what you get with an SDK application is the ability to just run it wherever the platform is available. Right, and the SDK does that through the magic of these classes that we bundle up into the APKs. Yeah, and uh, and the problem with multiple architectures, uh, even today, you could decide to uh, pick one of the architectures that ex that is supported by every Android phone. So if you go all the way back to the first Android phone, you have to support ARM v5. Um, it's really slow. You don't get hardware floating points. You don't get uh, parallel floating point computations. You could uh, choose ARM v7, uh, but then you still can't use the Neon instruction set that lets you do four operations at the same time. Uh, and then when Google TV will release their SDK that runs on x86, your app will not work. Uh, so I it's obviously a prime for uh, highly efficient applications, and that's why we have RenderScript. So we'll get into some of the reasons why it's a portable uh, environment, but that's certainly uh, one of the big selling points about RenderScript, in addition to just the, the functionality and performance of it. Um, so as we said, it's actually it's gone public in 3.0. So as of the Honeycomb release, we actually exposed the APIs and allowed developers to write to it. 
Um, but it has been used um, internally for the live wallpaper stuff since 2.1. And in 3.0, it's used for live wallpapers still. It's also used for the YouTube, the, the cylinder, the video wall, uh, as well as books, the um, cylinder of, you know, the view of the hardcovers, the fronts of the books, as well as the page turning effect. Did you have a question? So th the question is, RenderScript is a public API in 3.0. Does that mean you can compile against 3.0 and run on older versions? No, uh, because we change the APIs a lot. Yeah, it's very, very different from what it used to be, uh, and a lot better. Uh, I could go, I could go on and on with war stories about the early days of render scripts. Uh, my favorite one is you have these two thousand lines of render script, and you have one syntax error somewhere. Uh, the error message you get is a dump of the CPU registers. That was annoying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who have never played with uh, Honeycomb, yeah. aha, behold, 3D. Ooh. And I think, yeah, books is not going to come in because it's not going to sync with my account either, right? Uh, we can try. Is that yes. So, and this is also render script. And actually, if you open a book and you go turn a page, um, that is also render script. Uh, so I believe we use a web view to render the pages and then it's mapped uh, in render script on top of a cool 3D mesh that we uh, change in real time. So, so this gives you an example of how we use render script uh, on the official Android platform uh, to create really cool animations in 3D with high performance. So man years of effort going into the latest, greatest technology on top of multi-core and GPU machines to turn a page of paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> a fake page of paper. Yes. All right, uh, so moving on. Uh, the syntax that you're gonna see in some of the sample code that we'll walk through is based on the C99 language, so it should be very approachable for people that have used C and C++, which is really not that different from other languages like Java. Uh, there's APIs at two levels. Um, so as, as we said, it's a portable uh, application environment, and part of that solution is it is actually part of an SDK application. So you have an SDK, for creating the activity, for initializing some stuff, and then diving down into render script code. So there's an API for using render script at the SDK level to sort of set things up, allocate memory, get things going. And then there's also an uh, uh, API at the render script level where you actually write render script code. Um, so we'll see uh, chunks of that stuff. Uh, one of the features of render script that's interesting is that it figures out how best to share the work on the given architecture. So not only is it portable code that's going to run everywhere, but it's going to determine at runtime how best to execute it. So if you've got a GPU and you're doing rendering, obviously it's going to farm that out. It's, it's basically a layer on top of OpenGL right now for doing the rendering, so all that stuff goes into the GPU. Um, for the compute side, when you're doing calculations, trigonometric, math stuff, vector operations, all that stuff is going to happen on the CPU. But if you have dual core, you can actually farm it out. So you can have multiple threads running in parallel on multiple cores. Eventually, you can also uh, potentially farm that out of the, to the GPU if that's appropriate. Right now, all the compute stuff is happening on the CPU. Uh, you want to talk about the for each? Uh, yes, we'll see a, a concrete example of this at the end of the talk. We, we'll do some live coding. Um, but so this idea of being able to use multiple cores, so either we can use you know, two cores on the, on the Tegra 2 chipset, or if we were able to run on the GPU, we could run uh, how many hundreds of cores the GPUs have these days. Um, and this is done with a very simple API on the render script side called RS4H. Uh, and this is actually one of the reasons why you do a lot of the setup on the Dalvik side with the, the, the Java uh, API. Um, it's because we don't want you to be able, able to do any allocation from the, from, from the script, uh, because then when you use RS4H, it, it just makes uh, all the synchronization prime disappear. Uh, so it's a very simple API to use. Again, we'll see an example of that later. Uh, and this is how we run on multiple cores. So if you were to write uh, the same thing, you know, using the, the Java programming language, you would have to create threads and you uh, have to do some synchronization and figure out how many cores you have, or maybe, you know, figure out a way to use OpenCL or CUDA to use the GPU. Um, just using RS4H will do all the, the leverage for you. So there's an article that I wrote a few weeks ago and finally got around to posting uh, last week um, called Android Rendering Options uh, that explains basically what's on this slide. Um, every time we get anywhere near mentoring uh, render script or honeycomb, then people say, well, you've got all these different ways of, of putting pixels on the screen. What am I used, supposed to use when? Um, so here's the way I picture it. Um, uh, so this is my perspective. I think it's correct because I always do. Um, so there's basically four buckets that you can think of. There's 
one big bucket called the NDK. And basically, if you're porting an application from some other platform or you have a lot of native code or you've got a native library, you just want to get the thing working on Android, this is an option that makes sense, right? So there's the C code, there's the GL APIs, uh, everything just works. On the SDK side, you have basically three options to think about. First of all, there's the Canvas API. This is kind of the default. If you write a normal SDK application, you've got buttons, you've got list views, you've got all this, you know, the, the normal view hierarchy. And then if you have custom rendering, you can override the on draw method and you get a Canvas object in there. And then you call operations on the Canvas like draw text or draw bitmap or draw line. Uh, this is the Canvas API in the SDK. Right? And with so Canvas, you can only do 2D. Uh, right. So, it, it, and also it's interesting because it's very good at doing 2D graphics. Uh, right. And as of Honeycomb, it's also hardware accelerated. So one of the reasons that people look for other rendering operations, be it NDK or OpenGL wrappers, prior to um, 3.0 was that we weren't hardware accelerated. So yeah, you could do 2D graphics, but if you want to do fast 2D graphics or if you want 3D graphics functionality, then you had to look elsewhere. As of 3D, uh, 3.0, we've got GPU acceleration for the graphics. So all of that stuff is now uh, pretty fast. Um, There's a question. Did we stick with Lipskia, uh, which is the, the native 2D library that we use behind the canvas, and did we hardware accelerate that? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we still use uh, the Skia library for some operations, but we hardware accelerate the drawing um, underneath the, the Java Canvas API. So there's a new native library that the canvas talks to that lives side by side with the old Skia library. You, you can think of the canvas API as kind of being a wrapper on top of Skia. And prior to 3.0, we would call down from the canvas API into native code and render everything through Skia. Now, instead of going through Skia, we go to this other code that translates that into OpenGL calls instead. But some of the rendering operations aren't handled uh, automatically through OpenGL, like path rendering has to be written to a bitmap first. So we use Skia to render it to a bitmap, and then we draw the bitmap through OpenGL. So some of the alpha blending bottleneck and things like that have been converted into GL? Uh, yeah, all the bottlenecks, that was the, the reason. All the bottlenecks that we had with software rendering, uh, they pretty much don't exist uh, anymore because we use OpenGL. If you're interested, uh, we gave a talk at Google I.O. called Android Accelerated Rendering. Uh, the video is on YouTube. We give all the details and we talk about some of the limitations and primes with this approach. Yeah. So the, the render script samples in the SDK do not run in the emulator. Uh, yes, that's correct, because they require OpenGL ES2, and it's not supported in the emulator yet. yet. Uh, there was a demo, uh, a preview of the emulator supporting OpenGL ES2 at Google I.O. It's coming. Yeah, not only supporting the functionality, but also supporting the performance uh, that the emulator needs for graphics. Um, OK, so Canvas API, we're done. Second option, open, OpenGL wrappers. There are wrappers at the SDK level for OpenGL ES1 and OpenGL ES2. So if you want to write an OpenGL application, but you want it to be portable, or you want it to actually work with other stuff in the SDK, um, then you can certainly use the OpenGL wrappers and basically write a full on OpenGL uh, application at the SDK level. Um, it's mostly for simple applications uh, because there is a certain amount of overhead associated with every call through to JNI, which anybody that works with JNI has probably noticed before on every platform. Um, so every one of those OpenGL calls is basically a wrapper on top of native functionality. So you've got to go down through that layer every time. Uh, if you're writing a game, that may not be the most appropriate way to do it um, because that's the kind of overhead you don't want to take. Um, if you're doing simple 3D functionality, you're just drawing a quad every now and then, you need it to be a texture map, that's great. Uh, but one of the primers of OpenGL is, how many of you have played with OpenGL before? Uh, OpenGL ES2? Okay, same amount of people. Uh, for those of you who have never tried it, uh, actually last Friday I wrote a, a little sample uh, for something I'm working on, and I'm just drawing a photo on screen. That's all I'm doing. That's 400 lines of code with OpenGL ES2, because there's a lot of setup uh, involved. So even when you want to, to, to draw something very simple in 3D, it's still quite a lot of work. You have to learn quite a bit uh, about OpenGL. Um, so here comes RenderScript that will do a lot of that work for you. Uh, and also RenderScript, so RenderScript will use internally OpenGL to do the rendering, so it won't be faster at drawing, uh, but all your logic will be native code. So we get rid of the pain of initializing OpenGL, and we get all the efficiency of running native code instead of running inside a virtual machine. Uh, question? Uh, 
Uh, is it similar to GLUT? Uh, GLUT was a, a utility library for OpenGL on the desktop. Uh, mm, yes and no. I mean, it has some features like draw quad, for instance, to draw a quad. Uh, but it's mostly that it will do all the initialization for you, handle the threading, stuff like that. And then uh, it's got other functionality in there as well, like compute and vector operations and stuff that GLUT didn't approach. Okay, so uh, when you're writing a render script application, there's some sort of basic steps. Um, first of all, you figure out what it is you actually want to run in render script. Um, a couple of the key uh, elements to think about it, it for render script applications are uh, loops that you want to speed up or particular pieces of functionality that aren't going to work through the SDK, like you're doing 3D graphics. So you may use render script for just bite-sized pieces of like, I want to speed up this inner loop or I want the, the following effect on this custom view. And you can actually just write that thing in render script. Um, and it'll draw to its little uh, frame buffer and, and be all happy and accelerated. And, but the rest of the application could be completely SDK. On the other hand, you may want the entire application, like the books application, to be a render script application. Um, OK, so you figure out what it is you actually want in render script. And then you have two sides of the render script application to write. You have the render script file itself where you write the functions and you expose the fields that you want, the data structures, all the, the core functionality of what it is RenderScript is going to do. And then you write the files on the SDK side. And these are the files that basically initialize and create the script, bind to it, and uh, initialize it and start it running. Um, and we'll go over some of these steps in a, a bit more interesting detail. But this involves stuff like allocating the memory that you then hand over to RenderScript, because one of the key constraints with RenderScript is it allocates nothing. Right, you can have a simple field in there, but you cannot have an array of objects. Instead, you would allocate that array at the SDK side, hand it over to RenderScript, and then RenderScript can operate on that. Uh, and then finally, you just you know, shape your application. That's easy. OK, so compilation steps. So this, is, this is part of the interesting technology behind RenderScript. Uh, we use LLVM, which is an open source available uh, yeah, compiler it, and runtime. It's, it stands for Low Level Virtual Machine. Uh, do we use Clang? Uh, it's a variation of Clang. OK, so we actually use two pieces of LLVM. One is the front end, and one is the back end. Uh, on the front end, we compile the source code that you write, the actual render script application, into bit code. And then we ship that bit code. We, we pack that binary in with the rest of your SDK code into the APK. And then when your application actually launches on the device at runtime, we do the other step, the back-end LLVM. So we actually have a small LLVM uh, compiler sitting on the device, which at runtime will then say, oh, OK, this needs to be compiled into device code. And this is how you get the portability that we were talking about, right? Because you're shipping not source code, but this bit code that is uh, device independent. And then at runtime, it's actually installed on a device, and it knows, oh, this is the uh, ARM architecture, so I'm going to compile to that. It does that last step of compilation, and now you have natively compiled code running. Great. Uh, yes, the code is cached. Uh, so how do you use render script from uh, AOSP? Uh, go look at packages slash uh, wallpaper slash basic. Uh, that's the live wallpapers. And I, I believe there's one more target to add to say that you want to compile. Uh, yeah, Gingerbread is fine for you. Uh, because w we'll, see about, we'll see the details later, but when we compile the render script, not only do we compile um, the script itself into bit code, but we also generate Java code uh, right. that you need to use from your application. I think I created a, a vanilla project that just built. Okay. Okay. Added the Maybe it just code works. And, and I think the the 3.0 compiler knows what to do. The source for the compiler. Uh, y well, yes and no. The source for the compiler used until Android 3.0 is available. Uh, the compiler used in Android 3.0 will be made available, I believe, when we open source uh, the next version of Android. So which one is available today? Uh, whatever we were using before Android 3.0, which wasn't LLVM, I believe. We had the custom C compiler. So part of the initial step of compilation, um, when it's creating the bit code for the render script code, also creates wrappers on the SDK side. So when you put fields and functions in your render script code, uh, the compiler walks through those and creates wrappers automatically on this SDK side so that you actually have something to call from your Java code. Uh, so uh, it will create wrappers. We'll see some of this in the sample code, but you'll, you'll have uh, simple set and get functions for fields. And you also have um, wrappers for the functions themselves. So you can call directly into the functions in RenderScript. And that's the part that's an awesome replacement uh, for JNI uh, because we actually 
output for you all the, the, the boilerplate code that you would write for in JNI to just invoke a random native function. Uh, and something interesting to note, which um, I just learned today, uh, is you might worry, so as we'll see, uh, the render script code, the rendering code actually runs on its own thread, which is one of the reasons it can be so efficient. It's just hammering on this stuff as fast as it can. Well, you're on the UI toolkit thread uh, on the SDK side, and if you want to call one of these functions, well, what does that do to the render script code, which is sort of running in parallel doing its own little thing? Um, you are not actually making direct synchronous calls down into render script. You're instead putting uh, command requests onto a queue that gets serviced at an appropriate time later. So you're not going to actually interrupt the stream of control uh, on the native side and set some variable that's going to screw things up down there. Instead, you're basically calling into this wrapper code that puts something on a command queue and that gets serviced at the, the next available time. Uh, okay, and then the launch, LLVM compiles again, uh, and we have portability, ta-da. Uh, so the way you use render script uh, on, on in your application, so th there are really two ways of doing it, uh, and we're going to talk about the, the probably the most common one for now where we actually do rendering. Um, so you just create a regular activity and you have your layout and you can have your buttons and all that stuff. For instance, in the books application, uh, when we were turning the pages of the books, that's render script. But the RAND render script, they still had a menu that was created using the standard UI toolkit. Um, so to use render script in the UI, you just use something called the RS surface view. It's just uh, a subclass of surface view that's used to render OpenGL usually. Uh, and this one just does a little more work to initialize render script. Uh, and then uh, from that R surface view, you can get a render script GL object. Uh, and it's very important that, 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 you, that you get a render script GL object because that object is able to do rendering. If you don't care about rendering, again, we'll see about that later, uh, you can just use a render script object and you don't need a surface view. Um, then you just have to init your script uh, and to initialize the script, we generate a lot of code for you. So you just have to call APIs uh, that are created at compile time. Um, and then you have to bind, initialize the script itself. So you have to bind all the data that you want to use from the script. Because remember, you can't do any allocation inside the script except on the stack. Um, so if you want to create, I don't know, for instance, in one of the live wallpapers we have, uh, we use 12,000 stars rotating in, in, in some sort of a spiral galaxy. Uh, that's where you do that, you bind them to the script. Um, and then finally, you indicate what is the root script. So the root script is the script that render script will invoke automatically on every frame, uh, possibly 60 times per second to do the rendering. Um, and it will be clearer when we go to the code. Uh, okay, so all of that was initialization. And then at runtime, um, so as I said, uh, render script is running on its own thread, and it's calling this root function over and over again. And you tell it the frame rate uh, that you want by a return value from that function, which we'll see. And there's no indication from the SDK that's required. In fact, it's probably better if you don't disturb it. If you want the highest performance possible, just let it do its own thing. Uh, you probably want to interact with it to some extent, like user interacts, they press a button, this changes a value, you want to push that value down. All of that stuff is very easy, but um, you don't necessarily want to interrupt it on every frame. Like You don't necessarily want to run an animation on the SDK side that is setting values that are then being used at render script time. That synchronization between the two of them is going to end up costing you performance. It's probably better to just do all of that internal stuff on the render script side. Uh, and root is called rep repeatedly, and you determine the frame rate by a simple return so value. So uh, how do we handle real-time interaction? Yeah. So like Chet mentioned, render script runs into its own thread, and there's a message queue to uh, interact between the two threads. So, uh, it's, re it's actually how the UI toolkit works itself. There's a, the, there's a UI event queue. Uh, so we just push, m push messages to, the, uh, to, the, to that queue. And when it's time to render a new frame, we process as much of the queue as we can. So we'll just see the, the later stage. So as usual, you have to go as fast as you can to not miss anything. It, it's not like you have to avoid it for you know, everything. It's, I mean, that would be a perfectly fine interaction. One of the render script examples is exactly that. So it's a list view that runs with render script. You would not notice any performance lag. It's more like if you're trying to get you know, the highest compute uh, uh, performance possible, then you don't want to interact with SDK code at the same time. Uh, yes, yeah, so so you're talking. So the question is about uh, one of the live wallpapers called Grass, where from time to time uh, we send a, a huge chunk of data to the script, and that contains, for instance, your position on the planet, so that we can change the time of the day in the in, in the wallpaper. Um, it was done this way because when I wrote that live wallpaper, uh, that was the only way to do it. You could just put just a giant blob of bytes. Uh, these days, you can write one variable instead. Uh, so much you can also invoke functions. At the time, we were not able to in invoke functions in the render script. Uh, that, that's why we mentioned earlier that the live wallpapers are, are 
both good examples of render script and also bad examples. Uh, one of the good ones is Galaxy, for instance, or Water. Um, yeah, so we mentioned that you can't do any allocation from the render script. Um, so all the allocations are done on the Dalvik side and you use three classes to, 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 to perform the allocation. So we have the allocation class, uh, elements, and types. Um, and it's, under, I, it's, it's very important to understand what those, those things do, even though you, in practice you don't really see them very often. Um, so when you, when you want to describe um, a data structure, for instance a bitmap, you use the three classes. So the first one is the element. The element um, is the most basic unit of data that you have in your structure. So for instance, in the bitmap, each unit of data is a pixel. And a pixel in a 32-bit bitmap is made of four uh, unsigned bytes. Uh, so to create a bitmap allocation, we would start by creating an element that contains four bytes. Uh, and each byte can have a name. So one of the bytes would be the alpha, another byte would be red, green, and blue, and so on. Um, a type is just an element and a dimension. So for instance, if your bitmap is 100 pixels wide by 100 pixels high, uh, the type of the bitmap will be your element of four bytes and the number of pixels, so it will be a, a 100 times 100. And finally, the allocation just takes a type, and you can see that as the um, as just the blob of, of memory uh, that backs the type. So the type describes what the, what the memory layout is, and the allocation is the actual blob of memory. Um, uh, yeah, so that's about it. And like I said, um, in practice, you don't really have to deal with those. Uh, and Chet will talk, talk about an example that you wrote. Um. Right, so we'll, we'll walk through. It, were you to manually create these things, you can see what's involved. Um, in actual fact, there's, uh, there's utility functions that make all of this stuff much easier, which we'll also see. Um, and a lot of this code actually came from some of the code that was automatically generated from some samples that we'll see today. So this is what you would actually do if you were doing it on your own. But you know what? If you declare it in RenderScript and access it from the SDK side, it's way easier because it basically writes this stuff for you. OK, so let's say that you have the following information that's going to track the position and the speed of some object um, for this, this flake object that we're going to, uh, to send spinning around the screen. Uh, okay, so these are the data types. You've got, a, uh, you've got three floating point values here. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, I want an element, so we're going to use a builder object. There's builders for most of these types of classes in RenderScript. It's, it's a common pattern that you will get used to, um, whether you want to or not. Um, it makes it handy for sort of adding incremental things along the way and then creating it. It's like an incremental way of doing a constructor. Okay, so we create a builder given the render scripts, and then we add elements to it. So we say, OK, I want to add a floating point element. There's lots of um, standard elements that are already pre-created for you in the element class. You can refer to one of those if it's just going to be a simple type like this. OK, so I want to add an element that's going to be my position x, another one for the position y, another one for the scale, and then I'm going to create the element by calling the create function at the end. OK, so that's the first part. We created an element. Second part, we can create a type. Given the element that we created before, this E thing, we can say, OK, I want a type that's going to be created by calling type.builder. We'll construct it like that, and we'll set the uh, dimension. And I think I forgot to call the create function. So there's actually one uh, step missing there where you just call create after doing uh, the set x. Notice this is not a set x position. Um, x is actually the dimension that you're setting. So we're going to have uh, n of these flakes. So we simply set that dimension, um, and that helps create the type. Uh, and here we use x, but in graphics, there are different types of dimensions. So for instance, when you do 3D graphics, a cube map um, is a, a, a cube map is a dimension for texture. We have mip map levels. It's also a different type of dimensions for texture. So the one that's, that's the most common is set x. Um, it's just a way to, to indicate how many items you have. OK, so we have the element that describes what the types are. We have the type that describes the element as well as how many of them there are. And then finally, we have the allocation, which is the actual memory that's allocated to hold all this stuff, which is basically going to be an array of these flakes. Um, you can think of this as basically wrapping a malloc at the native level, because it basically wraps a malloc at the native level. Um, so we say allocation dot create types, and we pass in the type here along with the render script, and that gives us the allocation that we want. Um, there are tons of different. Uh, constructors that you can call. I'm just walking through one particular narrow example here. There's a question. You're still at the SDK level here, right? uh, yes, yes, that's always SDK. Java, yep, 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 yep. 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 Haven't touched render script uh, yet. Okay, okay, so instead of doing all that manual approach of creating the element and then the type and then the allocation, you could also say, 
I want to create a sized allocation, uh, and I'm going to pass in the element that we created first, and then n for this number of flakes that we want. And it'll give us um, the allocation. Then if we also want the type, then we can ask for the type from that allocation. So um, shortcuts for doing all this stuff uh, in general. OK, here's another way to approach it. So instead of creating the stuff manually all at the SDK level, we could create a data structure at the render script level. So this is actually render script code. You'll see it later in, the, in one of the demos that we walked through. So we have two float values for position x, position y, a float value for speed. And we've declared this as a structure. We've declared this flakes field to be a pointer um, to things of that type. So this is basically an array uh, that we call flakes. And then on the SDK side, we can say, OK, I want uh, my field to be equal to script field underscore flake. This is generated code for you. It generated from this information, specifically from that name right there, it created something called script field flake uh, that you can then call into as a method. Pass in your script. You pass in the number of flakes that you want to create. And you tell it the usage pattern that you're going to have. Uh, and then you bind it. And you say, OK, I've created. This is basically my allocation, and then I bind it to be equal to that. OK, so having done this, this allocates the memory. This passes that down to be useful at the render script level. And now in your render script code, you can refer to elements inside of this uh, just as an array. So this is just as if you had done, oh, flakes equals malloc of something. If you were in C code, which you're not, so you can't do a malloc. Right? Uh, OK, so there are is, as we said, there, there's APIs at both the SDK and uh, the native the render script level. Um, so on the SDK side, everything is in the android.renderscript package. Um, and there's not actually that many classes that you need to get a um, uh, hold of. Uh, and you can walk through these pretty quickly. But there's sort of some basic block types that you need to get used to. There's allocations, like the stuff that we just walked through. There's types um, that you should get used to. Uh, there's uh, programs, and we'll go over that in a minute. Um, and then there's some rendering setup stuff for actually initializing stuff uh, to start the scripts, which is the interesting part. You want to talk about programs? Uh, yeah, so programs, the names that we use are, are generic names that are used in, in, in graphics uh, to talk about 3D pipelines. Uh, so some of those names are a little bit different when you use to OpenGL, but they're the same ideas. Um, so we have four different types of programs. We have program vertex and program fragments uh, that are basically the equivalent of vertex shaders and fragment shaders in OpenGL, at least OpenGL ES2 or on the desktop, you know, any version of, of OpenGL with shaders. Uh, so the program vertex, its job is just to calculate the position of every vertex in the mesh. So if you're just drawing a rectangle, you have four vertices, and the program vertex can, at runtime, modify the shape of the, of the rectangle by just moving those vertices one by one. And that, that is run on the GPU, so it's very efficient. Uh, program fragment, it's the same idea, except it's at the pixel level. So once, once you have uh, positioned the vertices, uh, the GPU will rasterize the shape into a series of pixels. And the program fragment's uh, job is to just um, output a color for each of the pixels. Um, so usually this is where the program fragment is where you do like interesting stuff like a blur. That's where you put your texture. That's where you do color filtering. All the fancy visual effects that you've seen, for instance, in games, uh, they're done by the program fragments mostly. So uh, if you're familiar with vertex and fragment shaders, you can think of these things as wrapping that functionality in addition to the other functionality of actually supplying values um, and telling it how to, uh, how to actually supply the values that the shaders are dependent upon. So we'll see some code later where we supply the shader that this takes, which is straight up GLSL in addition to binding to constants that are then going to be supplied to the shader? It's, the question is, do we generate bit code for the shaders, or do we use GLSL? Uh, so the answer is neither. Uh, we have a, a pre-built shaders for common uh, use, use cases. Like if you just want to texture something, we, we wrote our own GLSL shader that you can use directly without having to write it. Otherwise, you can supply your own GLSL code. Uh, something we'd like to try to do in the future would be to use render script code for shaders. Uh, so you would use the same language for shaders and yeah, programs. No, yeah, it, it's, it wraps it's the GLSL. shader itself as well as a little other functionality. But you basically pass in, if you're writing a shader from scratch, you pass in a string. Mm -hmm. And that string then gets compiled uh, as part of the GPU. Yeah. The GPU basically compiles that the same way it would if you were doing it on you know, yeah, so NDK. Or or yes, but, but right now, uh, drivers do not understand the render script, so we use GLSL. We don't generate into a GLSL. We 
you write to GLSL okay. if why, you want. Why don't you wait till we see some yeah. sample code? You'll That'll see. Be a little less confusing. Uh, and two other programs. So uh, the program store is once you've rasterized the shape and once you've decided like for each pixel what the color will be, um, you have to store that pixel onto the frame buffer or any render target. Um, and this is basically called also blending. Uh, so this is where you decide like whether or not you should take into account the alpha value of the pixel. Uh, this is really simple, um, and you and you you can't write custom program stores. Um, and finally, program raster. Uh, this is Rarely used, this is how you do culling uh, if you want to, to discard um, uh, hidden faces in a mesh or if you want to use point sprites, if you know what point sprites are, uh, that's the program master that you're going to use. Um, so the two important ones are program vertex and program fragment. Uh, so one of the things that just came up is whether you actually write your own shaders. In a lot of cases, you don't have to. Um, the sample code that I'm going to walk through later uh, well, there, there's a mix, but one of the applications I wrote doesn't use shaders at all. It just uses the pre-built ones. So if you use the builders um, for program vertex fixed function um, or program fragment, fragment fixed function, these actually use uh, generated shaders so that you don't have to deal with the, th you know, the details of actually writing a shader. A lot of stuff is just going to do something simple like, well, I've got a matrix and I have some vertices. Can you transform it for me? It turns out, yes. Uh, we, we know how to do that. Yeah, so we have can, some shaders that know how to do the simple stuff. You can think of the, the, the fixed function programs as an emulation layer for OpenGL ES1. So if you're used to OpenGL ES1 uh, where you could just do everything without shaders, then you can use that to do the same thing. If you're used to OpenGL ES2, uh, you don't have to use those. You can just write your own shaders by hand. This is just a convenience. Uh, and in some cases, maybe you actually want to write a uh, shader for one of these levels, but not the other. So there's another example we'll probably see where there is a vertex shader because it's doing something in particular with this custom data structure that we have. But for the fragment shader, all we want to do is texture map each pixel. Well, we can use the fix function for that side of it. Okay, so then there's the other part of the SDK API. So there's the the things that are pre-existing, you can poke through the SDK and see all the classes for type and element and allocation and stuff. The other part is the part that's dynamically generated through the compilation process. And this is the one that takes a look at the fields and the functions that you expose in your render script code and exposes them as wrapper functions on the SDK side so that you can actually call into those functions and actually compile your code. Uh, that would be nice. Um, so we'll, we'll see some of these uh, for the, the render script code that we wrote. Um, and basically, it's, it's those two type of things. You have fields and you have functions, and they get exposed as fields that you can set and get and functions that you can call with arbitrary parameters. Okay, so here's some examples of that. On the render script code, we have a couple of simple variables here. Here's a Boolean, uh, and here's a simple function, um, set new num flakes. Um, and these are taken from directly from my code. Uh, and if you're calling those from the SDK code, this one is simply going to call a set function for the initial field. So it says, okay, scripts.set draw FPS. This is a wrapper function that was created for you at compile time. And then you pass in a Boolean value and it magically sets it on the Boolean underneath. This one is going to call this function down there. In this case, I didn't want to just set the field. I actually wanted to perform some functionality at the same time. So I created a field to set uh, an internal value. And then this um, API was automatically generated for me given this method description. Uh, so I pass in an integer value uh, and it does the right thing. And then there's a render script API. Um, and there's various parts of this. There's too much of it to go over. I just wanted to give sort of a sampling of the types of things that you can find in that API. And then we'll see a bunch of it in the sample code that we're going to crawl through. Um, so there's types that you would be used to and maybe some that you wouldn't. So there's floats and there's ints and there's long and then there's shorts and bytes and all that good stuff that you're used to from C. There's also vector versions of, of these. And these are very important, especially as you get into matrix and uh, graphics calculations and compute calculations where maybe you've got these two RGBA values that you want to modulate uh, together. Well, you can actually just multiply two float fours together. It'll do the vector operation. Yeah, and we'll see a good example of uh, how vectors uh, can simplify your code. And there's a lot of uh, variations of the same kind of method um, and the same kind of type because they all take you know, different variations of these vector types. Um, so you can have a, a multiplication that, that operates on two float twos or two float threes. Um, so there's a lot of repetitiveness in there, um, but not actually that much functionality. It's just a lot of good sort of solid core graphics and compute functionality. 
Um, also in types, uh, obviously you want matrices if you're dealing with graphics, so we have 2x2, 3x3, uh, and 4x4 four four matrices. Um, you have some core functionality. You've got a bunch of this stuff to go along with the matrix types. We might as well be able to multiply the matrices or set a rotation or concatenate a translation. All that stuff exists. Uh, clamp functionality, um, compute functions. Uh, so you've got all the, the basic trig stuff that you would expect, a bunch of the math stuff, um, power operations, exponentials. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of stuff. It was way too much to belabor by uh, putting it on slides. Uh, and then on the graphics side, I put in some sample um, functions. Uh, you've got some very basic text stuff, so you can draw a text screen onto the screen, uh, draw a text string onto the screen. Um, you can set the, the font and the font color. Uh, you can draw a quad, um, and you can clear color. Uh, but what you're going to end up doing mostly, if you want performant graphics, is actually drawing a mesh. So the, I think the sample that I use, no, it actually does do a draw mesh. Draw quad is there for simple use cases. If you're just drawing a square, drawing a rectangle, uh, go ahead and draw, call draw quad. Uh, but if you actually want high performance graphics, you want to probably issue more vertices than that single quad at one uh, time. And for that, you would create a mesh, and then you would call draw mesh, and it'll whip through all of those um, at the same time. This is not a constraint of render script. This is just how GPUs work. The more vertices you stuff in at once, the happier they are. You want to keep your GPU happy. Um, links to more information. Uh, Jason Sams is the, the guy behind a lot of the RenderScript stuff. Um, and he wrote a part one and part two article on RenderScript. I think he's also working on one on memory allocation stuff, so that'll probably be out sometime soon. Um, so on the Android developer blog, you can uh, do a search for his name and find those. Uh, the article that I wrote to sort of give the, the higher level view of, of how to think about Android rendering is on my blog. Uh, graphics-geek.blogspot.com, and there's the Android SDK samples. We're going to see some of those um, very soon, uh, but you should just use the ADK um, and uh, open up the samples directly. You can build and run them um, on a 3.0 device or a 3.1 device. Now for the code. Yes, there's a question. Uh, the samples come with API level 11, so Android 3.0. Now, uh, do you want to run the demo first so that they know what yeah. we're going to show? So this is a beautiful demo that, that Chet wrote. And I'm actually re really proud of him because usually he shows uh, balls <laughs> on the screen. And he did something different this time. It's awesome. After like five or six years. <laughs> All right. So I wrote, this is actually an SDK application. Uh, somebody asked for a simple benchmarking application. Um, they just wanted back. an animation running on the screen while they did some background processing, and so they wanted something that would show obvious uh, performance uh, hiccups as they happen. So I wrote this with SDK code. We can walk through this if you really want to see SDK code, but I'm basically drawing bitmaps. I'm setting a translation and a uh, rotation on these things, and then just calling canvas.drawbitmap. And you can add a bunch of these um, little droid flakes on the screen. Um, and then you can see, OK, so this is hardware accelerated. This is with the stuff that we did in 3.0 to speed up graphics. You could turn that on off uh, just for laughs. And then there's a frame counter over here. So we're getting 14 frames a second versus 40, 52. We could pop this up, take it out of hardware, and uh, suffer. Um, OK, anyway, that was the SDK application. I want to do something simple, uh, similar with RenderScript to see what it would take. Um, so. I ran it again. Uh, so then I have this one roughly the same. The frame counter works a little bit differently. Um, I'm just using RenderScript's internal frame counter here to see what frame rate we're getting there. Um, you're actually going to see very similar performance characteristics. Uh, I must have changed the code. <laughs> I did. One of my last edits, I was cleaning up the code right before we came up here. I must have changed the blending mode or something. Uh, that's unfortunate. Um, anyway, so all of these have an opaque black background. They, they used to be transparent just about an hour ago. Um, this actually gives a very similar frame rate to the hardware accelerated canvas version because essentially we're fill rate limited. We end up just bottlenecking at the GPU. Uh, on the SDK side, we're pre-scaling into bitmaps and then we're uploading the bitmaps into textures and letting the GPU rock on it. 
Uh, here we're basically doing the same thing. We're rendering meshes which are te texture mapped quads um, and you know, we can shove down roughly the same number uh, down there. So it's nice that we uh, got that performance um, from the SDK. There are other things uh, Roman's going to show an example later where the performance benefits of RenderScript are a little more obvious in some cases. Um, and then in addition, you could have 3D functionality, which I didn't happen to explore on this one. RenderScript, it renders on the GPU. Yeah, so rendering is on the GPU uh, for computations. Uh, it's on the CPU, but we plan on adding support for the GPU. Uh, so potentially, this could run entirely on the GPU, including the logic of the application. Yeah, actually, if, if I had a non-GPU version of the render script uh, version of the application, it would be even faster because it wouldn't run at all. <laughs> so infinitely fast if you don't do anything. Yeah, well, th th that, that's what's nice about render script. And again, we'll see an example after this one uh, um, about um, compute. Uh, if you write your code with render script, as you get more cores, uh, because manufacturers add more cores in their devices, your stuff will get faster and you don't have anything to do, which is always nice. I want one core per droid, <laughs> and I will be happy. So let's walk through some render script code. Version of the API, this is the package name. This is important because we need to reflect it into the correct package so that you call appropriately from your SDK code. Um, this is a header file of render script itself, so you can actually uh, get a uh, handle on the, uh, the functions that you're going to call in render script. This is the data structure that um, I saw an abbreviated version. Uh, I put in a, an abbreviated version in uh, one of the slides. Um, so this is going to hold information about a particular droid flake. So I'd like to know the position. Notice it's a float too. So this is going to have a dot x and a dot y uh, field inside of it. I've got speed. I've got scale. I've got rotation y and rotation speed. Um, so this not only holds where it is and how it's rotated and how large it is, but it also holds the speed of it because for every frame, I'm going to say, okay, how much time has elapsed and how far should I move this thing uh, given its current speed and how much should I rotate it given its current rotation speed. Okay, uh, we have a mesh object which I'm going to allocate memory for and populate at the SDK side. We'll see that later. Um, we have two programs that I'm going to use. There's the vertex, program vertex and the program fragment. Uh, again, I'm going to allocate, uh, well, I'm going to initialize those at the SDK side and then set them on that uh, side. And then we bind them in the inner loop as we're actually walking through uh, the root function. We have some simple um, fields that I use throughout here. So I've got the start time, which I use for tracking uh, frames per second. I've got preve time, which I use for calculating the inter-frame delay so that I know how far to move and, and how much to rotate these uh, droid flakes. I'd like to know the number of flakes that I have on the screen at any one time. We can actually check if we have an array which we, uh, which we allocated through one of these allocations that we'll see. We can check the dimension and then just walk that array by using the dimension um, dynamically. However, the way that I use that array is I actually allocate potentially more than I, um, more droid flakes than I are actually uh, present on the screen at any given time. So this is a temporary variable that I use uh, to know how far to iterate. Uh, the screen width and screen height I use occasionally, so I pass them down in the init function. Uh, this is an integer values for the size of the bitmap. I use that uh, in conjunction with the scaling size to know how large to draw this thing. Um, there's an option to, uh, to trace the frames per second that we're getting at any given time. So this is a Boolean variable that holds uh, whether we're actually tracing that out. And this is the frames um, counter, which is used, again, to track the frames per second that we're getting. Uh, so let's go down. I mean, a lot of this code should look like really approachable, right? It's C. Okay, well, this function calls that function there. Well, it needs a forward reference to it up there before it can refer to it. Um, pretty straightforward. Okay, the init script is called from SDK. We'll see that later. I want to pass in the size, the width, and the height of the screen. I also want to pass in how many droid flakes we're actually starting with. Um, so that I can initialize things correctly. So I set these internal variables here. I call this other helper function down here with the initial number of droid flakes. And I set the prev time, which is what uh, the inner frame delay is going to use as it calculates movement along the way. Okay, this function is called at startup time. It's also called when I hit the more or the less button to uh, add or subtract flakes on the screen. It's going to, at the SDK side, say, okay, well, this is the new number of flakes that you're going to have. Uh, it'll pass that number down here, 
Um, and then we basically initialize all the flakes that we're either, um, uh, all the flakes that we're adding to the array. Or if we're subtracting, if we're displaying less now than we used to, then we don't need to initialize anything. We just need to um, set the marker earlier in the array. Uh, so as we initialize, we say, OK, well, if I'm actually adding flakes, then let's walk through all the new flakes that we're adding in for each one of those. Um, so I'll just get a simple reference to the current flake. So you can see I'm walking this through. It's just like a normal array. The only weird thing about the array was that I allocated it somewhere else. Right? It, it migrated to my code. It didn't actually start there. Um, but otherwise, the way, to, way I refer to it is just the same as I would in any other C code. Um, so once I've got a pointer to that, then I can say, OK, we set the position. So this is a float2 object. So I say, OK, refer to the dot x value of that and randomize that based on the screen width. So I'm going to position this flake somewhere between 0 and the width of the screen. Same thing for y. I'm going to position it zero between 0 and the height of the screen. The speed, I'm just going to set to this random value. It's going to be at least 50 uh, to 200. Um, and what that does, this is you know, a value that I calculated, um, like all great engineering values, just by you know, setting some values and seeing what worked. Uh, but basically, this is how far it's going to move per second. And then in the inner loop, I calculate the elapsed fractions and multiply it times the speed. Uh, scale is going to be um, somewhere between uh, 0.1 and 0.7 of the initial size of the bitmap. So I had this initial size of the droid flakes, and they look a little bit better if they're um, somewhat smaller than that. So we have a randomized scale factor. We set the rotation value to be some random uh, angle between 0 and 360, and then we set a rotation speed uh, between negative 45 and positive 45. Hopefully all this code is very straightforward, and I shouldn't have spent all that time explaining every line. Uh, this is if I'm calculating uh, frames per second, then I will call this function along the way and say, OK, well, it is currently, this is one of the core render script functions. If you want to get the current time, which is kind of important in animations, then yeah, you can actu say. Actually, yeah. if you look at the, the name of the function, so here we're calling RS uptime millis. Uh, RS stands for render script. If, if you use one of the graphics function, you will see it's called RSG draw text, for instance. So we use different prefixes depending on what kind of function you are using. Uh, so RS uptime millis, that'll return a millipoint, uh, millisecond value, and you compare that to the previous time. Uh, so we're going to create a delta time here. Um, and then if we've elapsed a second since the last time, this is kind of a technique that I use when I'm doing uh, benchmarking or frames per second, because if you go every single frame, the number's going to flash so much on the screen, you're not going to know what's going on. Um, so every second, I go ahead and say, OK, now how, much have I, how many frames have elapsed since the last second? So we'll go ahead and calculate the elapsed seconds. We calculate the frames per second. Um, and then we just trace it out to the command line. Uh, in the SDK version, I actually output it onto the screen. That's a little more tedious in render script because there's not string manipulation functions. So you can output a character string, but actually creating that string takes a little bit more effort. It's probably easier to do at the SDK side and push it down. I decided, you know what, tracing to the command line shell is awesome. Uh, and then I reset the frames so that I can calculate it again later. It goes uh, to the logs. Goes to log cat. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how's the speed? I, am I talking like too fast or too slow? OK, good. All right, so this. Or oh, do you want him to shut up? <laughs> that works too. <laughs> I didn't propose that as an option. Sorry. Uh, OK, so this is the inner loop. This is the function that's going to get called. As soon as you bind to it um, as the root script from the SDK level, render script will just start calling it, and it'll call it until you, you uh, tell it to quit. Um, R root is, is the built-in name. Yeah, um, yeah, it's called root. Um, render script is still evolving. The idea is that you will eventually be able to build some sort of a scene graph of scripts. So the root function is the root of your scene graph. So y that's the main entry point, and then you'll be able to in invoke other scripts. Uh, in fact, there's another built-in function, init, which would automatically be called init with no args. Um, and that would be called before your script actually started. At initialization time of this particular application, I wanted to pass in parameters, so I didn't bother to implement that one. I implemented my own and called it directly from the SDK side. OK, so every time, so this is going to get called once per frame. So this is everything we need to do to display one frame of the animation. We're going to clear to a background of opaque black. So that's the alpha value, RGB of black. Uh, we're going to bind the program and the, uh, the program vertex and the program fragments. So this is saying, OK, for everything that gets rendered here, these are the programs, these are the shaders that you're going to use. 
So in this particular example, we use only one program vertex and one program fragment. But if you go look at the live wallpapers, they draw a background texture, then they draw, for instance, uh, the stars, and then they draw something else. Every time they use different program fragments or program vertices, depending on what they're doing. Right. So in that case, they would probably uh, do binds of the appropriate shaders, rendering operations, and then bind, and then rendering operations, because these programs are going to apply to whatever rendering operations are just about to be called. Uh, OK, so this is some timing information, because in the loop here, I'm going to walk through the array of, of droid flakes and calculate where everything needs to be moved and rotated to. So we'll, ca we'll say, OK, what time is it now? Get the delta time, calculate the seconds, uh, and then we actually start our loop. So we're going to do a simple iteration up to the number of current flakes that we have. We'll get a reference to the current flake in the array. We're going to calculate the new position. So we're going to take its current position and add in uh, the speed time, the number of seconds. So this is the speed per second. This is the number of seconds. We add it to the current position. Voila, it moves. Yeah, so flake underscore t is a structure that we declared at the beginning. Right, so there's a forward declaration here. And then there's the declaration of the structure at the end, so flake t. And then the array is of type flake t. Very much like c. And if you're not used to c, well, it's a good reason to learn c. It's actually really nice, C, I mean, not C++. Uh, let's see, I was down to the loop. OK, so we calculate our Y position. Rotation is very similar. Um, calculate rotation Y as adding in the current rotation to the rotation speed times the elapsed seconds. So now I can actually take that information of where this thing is and what angle it's going to be rotated to. And I can create a matrix and pass that in before I actually render my quad. So I declare a local variable here. We've got a trans matrix. We're going to load in. Um, we're going to load in the identity. We're going to actually that is, that is some useless. debugging code that I should remove. So ignore that one because I'm going to immediately load in a translation. Uh, so we load in a translation based on its current x position. Um, I'm doing an offset of the width and height uh, so that I actually rotate around the center of the snowflake because rotating around the corner looks goofy. Uh, so we basically back it off a little bit um, and then do our scale and our rotate. So we're going to scale and rotate around the center. Uh, and then we're going to translate um, for, and then we're going to translate given the, the width and the height of the droid again. These are just, it's like if you've ever done any graphics rotation stuff, you always have to factor in, well, what's the pivot point around which you're rotating? Yeah, and you always get it wrong yes. every single time. Yes, and you just, you, do, you just bang on the code enough where you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah the first time I did the uh, OpenGL stuff, I was at Sun working with Chet, and I asked those guys because they know how to do OpenGL. I'm like, how do you guys figure it out every time? They're like, oh, no, we don't. Like, we just tweak the numbers. <laughs> and That's the awesome works. thing about graphics is you see it on the screen. It's wrong. OK. I don't know what data peop database people do to get their programs right. Uh, OK, and then we actually upload this. So this is a render script call, RSG, program vertex, load mode, model matrix, um, uh, the trans matrix that we just created. So that'll basically push it up to be used for future rendering operations, which are here. This is the only rendering operation here besides the clear color. So we say draw mesh of flake quad. And we'll see what flake quad is um, in the SDK code later. We basically created and populated that on the SDK side. And it's just going to draw the same thing every single time. So the reason that we get flakes in different positions is, well, we draw the same quad, but before we draw it, we tell the matrix where to put it and how to rotate it uh, and how to scale it. So then we get them all positioned independently. So even though it's actually the same rectangle drawn over and over again, each time it's drawn with a different matrix, which gives us the effect that we want. It's worth pointing out that this would be more efficient if I actually used uh, a more complicated mesh and a more complicated data structure and a vertex shader to actually be able to render many flakes in one simple rendering operation. As it is, I'm doing one quad at a time, not terribly efficient, but for demo purposes, certainly did the trick. Yeah, a good example of that, if you go look at the source code of the Galaxy wallpaper, so we use 12,000 stars, and each star is a position that's independent of the other stars, uh, but it's done with one drawing call. It's just one giant mesh that we draw in one call. Uh, all right, and then if I'm drawing the stats, you know, based on that local, on the, um, the Boolean up above, then I call that function and I return one. This is my favorite part of all of render script. You return a number. And that number basically says how long it should take before calling me again. This determines your frame rate in render script. Okay, so by returning one, you're, I'm basically saying, okay, I'd like to be called every millisecond. 
However, it's going to be capped at the effective frame rate. So we get 60 frames a second because RenderScript knows that there's no reason to call me any more often than the current re refresh rate of the screen. So it's going to try to call me at one, but it's really going to back off and say, you know what, we're not ready to sync the screen yet anyway, so we'll just wait. So if this were actually acting as a return one, then I would be getting 1,000 frames per second. But you can see uh, the stats on the screen say that I'm getting more like 60 frames a second. Uh, there's another magic value if you return zero. Uh, that means that you don't want to run again. Uh, for instance, if you, uh, for some reason, if you want to render on screen, they don't use the GPU anymore, you return zero. And then from the, the, the Dalvik side, you can tell RenderScript to start again. OK, so that was RenderScript. And then we'll see um, there's three files that I had on the SDK side. There's Flaky, which is the main application where not much interesting happens. Um, we have an on create. I think you probably know what that is. Set the content view. I have a simple layout that's got a linear layout that basically has an area for the buttons in the checkbox. And then, um, and then we're going to stuff the view in a linear layout below that. Um, so we do, let me try to get this on the screen. It might work better. All right, so we're going to create one of these flaky view objects, which we'll see in a minute. Um, that's the second of three files that has this functionality. We're going to get a reference to the container where we're going to put this thing. We're going to add our view into that. So we've just stuffed the render script view in below uh, the controls that are going to go in the application. Um, we're going to then uh, add some actions here. So when they click on the show FPS checkbox, we're going to toggle whether or not we're spewing uh, stuff into the log. There's more and there's less buttons. And those are going to set up um, listeners and call a function on the view class which is going to end up uh, eventually calling into RenderScript. Uh, we've got a flaky view. Flaky view, another simple class um, that basically creates this RenderScript GL object that we wanted uh, and the render object. And that's where all of the actual logic of initialization and setup goes. Um, create it, surface changed. Oh, there's a print line because everybody needs that in their shipping application. Uh, this is where we actually create this thing. We get a surface config and then we create the RenderScript GL object. Um, we set the surface on it. Uh, then we create the, the flaky RS object. This is the thing that's actually going to talk to the script. It's going to create and, and communicate with the script. Uh, and then we initialize it with important information like how large are we. So this is, this is the class that sort of has the information about um, the window, the surface that uh, we're going to need. And then the other one is all specifically about render scripts. And what, once you initialize it, it's not going to run yet, right? Or is it just sort of set up, set up? Uh, this is still set up stuff. Uh, you'll see the point at which it'll actually start executing. That's in the other file. Um, the show FPS, these are the listeners that are going to be called by the buttons. These are basically just wrappers around function uh, functionality that's in the final class, which is here. OK, so flaky RS. A couple of internal pointers that we're going to need, especially this one, uh, the misses field. Um, we have uh, this is um, a field that was generated for us during the compilation process. This is basically a reference to our array. We're going to create an allocation uh, and then bind it to this, which is basically going to push that allocation down to the render script level where we can start actually um, manipulating the droid flakes. Uh, program vertex. And the program vertex, uh, program vertex and the program fragment are the, the vertex and fragment shader information that we're going to render with. Uh, num flakes, we're going to start out with 16, and then we're going to increment that and decrement that along the, along the way. Uh, this is a reference to the actual script. We're going to need that for calling into uh, render script functionality. OK, this init function gets called by the view class that we saw earlier. We'll set a couple of internal frames uh, fields here. Uh, we're going to create the script um, and say, OK, I want to create the new script here. Again, this is generated. Anything with these ugly underscores here, that's generated code that you're calling into. Um, so we're going to create this with references to the resources and uh, the render script object um, and the actual render script file that we created. Um, so flaky.rs was the name of the render script uh, file that we saw earlier. OK, M flakes, as I said, is a reference to the array of objects. This is actually the allocation that we're created, uh, creating. So this does the allocation for us. It says, OK, given the script object, um, given this generated uh, API, and given the number of flakes um, I want to create, give me an allocation um, with the following usage pattern. 
and then bind the flake. So we're creating an allocation and we're passing it down to RenderScript. This is what makes it available at the RenderScript level in this variable um, for it to then refer to as it walks through its loop. Okay, we're gonna load a bitmap, normal way you load a bitmap. We're gonna decode the resource. I'd like to know the width and the height because I wanna push those down to the native level. Um, and I do that by calling these generated functions here, set droid W and droid H uh, with the width and height of the bitmap. Uh, it's the fields that get wrapped by setters and getters. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's two things that get wrapped. There's fields get wrapped as setters and getters, and there's functions that get wrapped by other functions. Okay, um, there are different ways that I could have drawn this. As I said, it probably would have been more optimal to create a more complex mesh. Uh, and we could have also populated this at the render script level, but <coughs> wanted to show this instead. I use a simple triangle mesh builder which is basically going to create the quad. Um, so everything in, in GL, if you've done any graphics program, you know everything's a triangle, unless it's a point or a line, right? There is no quad. There's only two triangles that happen to sit next to each other. Um, so you can create, uh, and, and there's, there's different kinds of quads. There's different kinds of uh, triangles. You can have individual triangles. You can have a triangle strip, which is basically um, triangles that share uh, edges. And you can have a triangle fan, another uh, arrangement of triangles that share edges. Um, so we're going to create uh, our triangle mesh. We're going to basically walk through and set texture and vertex information for every one of these points. So there's going to be six uh, total points because they're going to be two individual triangles. Is that five? Something like that. Uh, oh, no, there's four points. Right, so we're setting up four vertices, um, and then we're going to set up the edges. The individual triangles are going to refer to those vertices um, that we set up. Right, so we're going to set the texture information. This is basically saying, okay, I want the upper left of the bitmap to refer to the upper left of the quad. I want the right-hand point of the bitmap to refer to the right-hand point of the quad, and so on. We set up the way the triangles are arranged based on these vertices. Um, then we say, okay, I want to create a mesh from this mesh builder that I just built up, and then we're going to push it down. So again, it's just like we, we did with the allocation with the flakes above. We sort of set up the data structure here, and then we push it down by saying, OK, now set the mesh there. This is the guy that actually got issued in the call to RSG draw mesh. Right? So the only thing he did with it at render script level was to actually draw the thing. Everything else happened at the SDK level. We set up the program vertex. Um, I'm just using fixed functions here. I'm not doing anything complicated. I'm basically transforming these things and projecting them onto the screen. And even the projection is very easy because I just want an orthographic projection to be the size of the window. So there's utility functions for all of this stuff in render script, and I was happy to use them. Uh, let me move over a little bit so you can actually see the code. OK, so we call the fixed function builder to create a builder for us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just create this thing. There's nothing complicated going on here. We uh, are going to create a projection matrix and set this, um, let's see if I can walk through here. We want this to be, we basically want to populate the constants internally in the program vertex. It's going to create a shader, right? It's got these, these pre-built shaders there, and it's going to expect information about the variables that are provided to it. Um, for instance, it would love to know what matrix you want to use when you project this onto the screen, because that's going to go into the calculations um, that figure out where to put the vertex in space. Right, so we're basically saying, OK, I want to populate the constants with the following projection matrix, um, which is going to be an orthographic, you know, just straight on 2D projection. If you're doing 3D programming, you would do something much more interesting, and there's other uh, builder functions in there to do that. And then we're setting the program vertex in the render script code like that. OK, hopefully this is getting a little boring now. You're like, yeah, 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 OK, generated code, set, underscore, blah, blah, blah. Good. OK, we're going to bind. Uh, sorry, no, this is the fragment code. Something very similar except for a fragment shader. Again, I was happy to use the fixed function one because I'm not doing anything complicated. All I want to do is have a texture map quad at the native level. I'm using decal mode because that basically takes this nicely um, uh, transparent back uh, texture and applies it as a decal on the quad. And usually I get a, a transparent background uh, uh, quad as a result. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, uh, let's see, give it the formats. We uh, 
go ahead and create the program fragments. Um, we bind the texture so we associate that bitmap that we created earlier with the texture that, this, um, that the shader inside the, the program fragment is going to use. Um, bind a sampler. The sampler is basically the, the blending. Uh, no, it's, the, it's how do we... How do we how you fetch data from the texture. Um, so if you want, um, when you resize a picture, you can apply nice filtering uh, to make it look better when you zoom in and out, which is what Chet is doing here. So we can use one of the, the built-in one. Uh, linear filtering is the one that you want. It looks good. Uh, so the, it's going to do bilinear filtering uh, across the bitmap. It's only also going to create MIP maps along the way. It looks a lot better. The initial version of this um, didn't use, I, I think it just used the default sampler and there was all kinds of flickery artifacts because scaling on the fly without doing any filtering doesn't look very good. Um, and then we set the program uh, fragment. Uh, bind the program store just using, I wanted to do uh, uh, just one of the canonical ones there. I didn't need to create anything um, custom. And this is where the initialization and starting of the script happens. So first, we invoke this method with the width and the height and the num flakes. That does the, that initialization step that we saw in the render script code. And then finally, we bind the root script. So this is a render script call saying, I want this guy to be the root of uh, my application that runs. And after we bind that, it starts out that thread and, and life starts. OK, so we're going to write a, a very simple application that just turns a color picture into a grayscale picture. So it's, it's the same thing that's in the SDK, but I'll walk you through it as I'm writing it. Um, and hopefully, I can still write it. So we're going to create a new Andro Android project. So there's nothing specific about render script. So you just target Android 3.0 or more. Uh, for those of you who can't see in the back, I just selected the, the, the target platform. Um, yeah, let's change the mix. That's a good idea. I should have thought about that. He's smart. Uh, let's see. Just creating the project. Am I supposed to type on here now? <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so we're just going to create the Android project. So I'm going to specify a package name, com.example.android.sf.sf. That will be good. Uh, and that's all. So again, nothing specific about um, a render script project. I'm just going to add a new drawable in my project because I want to turn the picture into, into a grayscale image. So I'm just going to add a drawable no dpi resource uh, folder. Uh, that's usually why you want to put images that won't be resized based on the density of the device. Uh, and I have a photo right here. We'll just put it. And that's it. And now you we can start writing the code. Um, so we're going to start with a very simple activity. Um, and because we're not going to do any graphics, uh, I don't need to create an RS surface view. I'm just going to use an image view to display the bitmap, the resulting bitmap. Um, so we just create a simple image view. Uh, and can you see the code I'm typing? Or do you want me to zoom in in the back? Well, I'll zoom in anyway because you, you're not responding. Uh, just setting up the type of scaling we want on the image. We, wa we, we will just center the image on screen, center crop. And I set this image as the content view of my activity. OK, now we're going to write the actual function. So draw grayscale. We're going to pass the image and the photo I want to turn into grayscale. Create the function. Here we go. So now we can start doing the, the fun part. Um, the first step, we're going to load our bitmap so we can actually process it. Uh, I'm going to use a bitmap factory. We're going to decode that resource. And that's the photo. So what's nice is that render script knows about bitmaps, as you will see. So we have a bitmap. I want to call it B, stupid eclipse. B. Here we go. Ah. OK. Now we want to create our render script. So I haven't created the script itself yet, but I'm just going to set up some of the environment. So we need to create a render script context. And you can see here I can create a render script, uh, a normal render script context, or I could create a render script GL. I don't care about rendering, so I'm just going to create a render script context. 
um, dot create. And that render script context is important because you pass it to pretty much every uh, method in the render script API. Um, now what we want to do is we have a source bitmap and uh, basically we want to uh, copy the content into an output bitmap and in the middle we want to do the filtering. So I'm going to need a second bitmap uh, and I want that second bitmap to have exactly the same characteristic as the first bitmap. So I'm just going to create a bitmap with the width and the height of the original bitmap. Uh, so those are all like standard Android APIs. Uh, let's go create bitmap. There we go. Uh, and render script can work only with allocations. So we need to create allocations from those bitmaps. And we have helper methods to do that. Um, let me rename that to in. There we go. So I'm going to create an allocation from the input bitmap. And we have a create from bitmap method. So I pass my render script context and the, the original bitmap. And that will be my in allocation. And we also need an allocation for the output bitmap. So we are going to read from the input allocation and just output into the output allocation. Um, and to rewrite my code, sorry. Um, so and the, the output allocation will have the same characteristics as the input allocation. So we want the same size and the same type. So once again, there's a helper method for that. So we can create an allocation from uh, create typed. So I pass the, RS, the render script context, and I get the type from my original allocation. So now I have two allocations that are exactly the same, um, except the first one, oops, except the first one co already has content. The content is what's in the bitmap. The second one is empty because I have, I have, I have not copied anything in it. Um, and then the next step will be to create the actual script itself, bind the allocations, and run the script. So now we need to, to write the render script. So I'm just going to create a new render script file. Uh, let's see. Uh, gray.rs. We need to specify uh, we need to specify the version number of the language that we're using. We need to specify pragma the Java package name for the generated source code. So com.example.android.sf. Um, <coughs> and I will have a filter function that we'll call later that will do all the work. Um, and I need to have the data that we created on the Java side. So we're going to use the, an RS allocation that contains the input bitmap, an RS allocation that contains the output bitmap. Uh, note here that I'm not creating a custom type. So in the in chat example, we create a new flake type. So we create a struct. Here, I don't really care because I, I, it's easy to understand what's in the bitmap allocation. It's just a bunch of pixels. So I could create a new structure with the red, blue, and, and green channel. But here, I won't, I won't even bother. Uh, and we'll also need a script. Um, now, on the Java side, all we have to do is bind all that stuff. So I can create. Uh, my new script, I pass the render script context, the resources, and the script source code. So as you can see, I'm, I'm creating a new instance. Sorry for the, the folks in the back. I'm creating a new instance of the class called script C underscore gray. Uh, it was automatically created as soon as I started typing in that RS file I just created. Can you make that go up higher? Uh, yes. Uh, let me add a bunch of empty lines. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we're going to keep a reference to the script. Stupid Eclipse. Stop. What is it doing? There we go. Like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not an Eclipse user. <coughs> OK, so now from that script, we want to bind all our data. Uh, so I'm going to set the in allocation to my input allocation. I'm going to set my output allocation to my output allocation. It's really hard. Um, and I'm going to set the script variable to the script itself. And you'll understand why. Um, then what we want to do is invoke the filter function that will do all the work. And, and after the filter function is invoked, uh, we'll have all the, the process data inside the output allocation. So then we want to take the output allocation and copy its contents um, into our output bitmap. 
Yeah, so script C gray was uh, generated as soon as I created that new file in the project. Somewhere we can actually look at it? Uh, it? Yes, yeah. yes, we'll, we, we can take a look afterwards if you want. Um, and then finally, I want to display my uh, image on, on, on screen. So on the Java side, pretty simple. We create a couple of bitmaps, we create allocations for render script, uh, we set up the script, we invoke the, the filter uh, function, and then we copy the result into an actual uh, bitmap. And then if we go back to <coughs> render script itself, um, so I, cr I, I created a script object here, and that's because I want to run my processing on multiple cores. So I want to automatically split the load. Uh, so for each pixel can be uh, processed individually on, on a different core. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use the RS for each function. And the RS for each function takes a script uh, as an input. Um, and I just need my little cheat sheet here. Uh, so RS, I'm trying not to use it, but the order of the parameters is sometimes hard to remember. Uh, so we pass the script. Uh, we pass the, the data, the input data, the output data, and that's an offset inside the uh, input data. Um, so when I write that line, we're going to invoke uh, a script. So the script that we're going to invoke here is actually this script here. We're going to invoke the root function. Uh, for every element of the input allocation, we're going to try to run it on an available core. So here on the... Which is per core, right? For each is, yeah, per core. Uh, well, actually, it's for each, it's per element inside the allocation. Um, render script will automatically spread, spread the processing on, on, on two cores. So here, we have a, a bitmap, and we're going to put one pixel on core number one, one pixel on core number two. When one of them is done, we send another pixel to that core, and so on. So we're going to just split the work on the, on the two cores. It's the zero. Uh, zero is the offset inside uh, the input allocation, so that you don't have to process everything. Um, I'm creating my root function. So uh, uh, a small difference is that when you create your root function, you can have no parameters. This is usually what you do. Uh, but when you use forage, uh, you can actually get parameters. Um, so my allocations, I know, is made of uh, every element is four bytes, alpha, red, green, blue. So I'm going to get a pointer to a uchar4, so a vector of bytes. Um, and that's my input data. We're going to output it inside. Um, a U-sharp 4, so that's the output allocation that has the same structure. And then you, you get other variables that you have to use. Um, so you get X and Y. So as the forage goes through the allocation, it will automatically increment the X and Y. So if you need the positions within the allocation, you can get, you can get those here. Um, and there's an extra one, I think. Uh, I need the const void. So I don't remember what that one does, but I've never used it. So let's forget about it. Um, and now if we want to convert a pixel into uh, to, to gray, all we have to do is take the red, green, and blue components. We just have to multiply them by some magic values. Uh, and then we, we take the resulting value and we apply it as, as uh, the red, green, and blue components. So usually the way you would do that uh, in Java, for instance, you have an int that's your pixel. You first have to split the int into the four different bytes. You take the bytes, you do the fancy multiplications, and then you recreate the pixel. Here, because we work with vectors, we can do something uh, even better. Um, so I'm going to create a special vector, a float3. And I'll explain what it does. Um, so it's a vector of three floating point values, and those are the values you want to use to multiply the, uh, your, your pixel colors with. Uh, so if I have a pixel that comes from the original image, I'm going to multiply the red component by 0 0.3, the green component by 0 0.6, and the blue component by 0 0.1. And the sum of, of those values uh, will become the grayscale value. Uh, turns out that what I just described is the dot product operation on vectors. Um, so the, the entire implementation is the following. We get our pixel from uh, the, the input allocation. Unpack color 888 in. Uh, so <coughs> what this does is we're, we get a bunch of bytes. Uh, and instead, we want to get a, a, a vector of floating values, of floating point values, uh, because it's better usually when you do graphics operations to work on floating points to avoid losing precisions. Um, then we want to create the gray pixel. So float3 uh, result is simply the dot product of, of the RGB values of the input pixel and our 
fancy vector that we just described. Um, so here again in Java, instead of that one line of code, you would have to do a lot of uh, bit shifting and or and floating point operations and conversions. And here it's all done for you in one line. Actually, you have that code in your old yes. project, right? So uh, I, I wrote the same algorithm in Java, and I'll show you the difference. Uh, and then when you're done, you just have to repack the value. Uh, pack color to 88. There you go. Uh, we pack the value back from floats to to uh, bytes. What did I do? The out, yes, the output allocation is not constant. OK. And so that should work. So let's try to run the code. Uh, grayscale run as Android application. Ta-da. There we go. It's in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the original image. Let me show you the original image. Also uh, happens to be I black I and white, but that's <laughs> beside the point. Yeah. <laughs> that is the original image. It's standard uh, standard technique for, for desaturation yeah. for converting so as it, as a color it turns image out, into there, there is not a single way to turn color into black and white. And photographers usually are, are really obnoxious because they each have their own way of doing it, uh, depending on the image. But this is, um, this is just a, a standard way of doing it. It gives you something that kind of looks good, uh, but it's not great. If, if you do a, a web search on desaturation or grayscale, you will come up with values that look an awful lot like that. They're easy to remember because the sum is one. Um, uh, yes, so let me show you now the, the original um, uh, version that I wrote using the Java language. So, so in X and Y on that, what would they be? In so in this case, X will be the, the, the index of the pixel inside the giant array, uh, and Y will be zero. I mean, what, if you, what you're passing in isn't, I mean, it seems weird that you're foreaching over something that may have nothing to do with X and Y. Okay. Uh, uh, again, but X and Y, they're not, don't see them as uh, like screen coordinates. They're just indices within a uh, multi-dimensional multi array. It turns out that the allocation I pass here is just one dimension. Uh, so the Y doesn't matter. But you could describe your, your array so that you, you get also a Y. Um, it, it's a little bit awkward. And actually, um, if I were to write that using ice cream sandwich, uh, the code would become this. Because, uh, and also, here we go. Uh, so in Ice Cream Sandwich, we also generate an rs for each Java method that you can invoke and does all that crap for you. Uh, so it will get even easier. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the original Java language code that I have here, here we go. So that is the Java function that was doing the same thing we just did here. Um, so you know, we go through the array, we get each pixel, we have to get the individual channels, uh, some bit magic, we convert them to float, some divisions, and then we have to, to create a pixel again out of it. Uh, you could do it on one line of code, and it would be really, really ugly. Yes, really hard to read. And, uh, and, and also, that version does not run on multiple cores. Uh, so that version, if you have to, th to, to make it multi-threaded, you know, it's even more code that you have to write. Um, the render script version, because we use vectors, it can automatically use the neon instruction set on ARM CPUs to process four, four pixels at a time. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. And actually, you can see around the code, I have a little bit of, of profiling code. Um, so the Java version of, the, of this, uh, this filter runs in about 400 milliseconds. The render script version runs in, runs in 0 0.02 milliseconds. So it's like you know, a thousand times faster. Um, and it's less code to write, and it's easier to understand. Um, so it's pretty nice. And also, next, you know, next year when we get a tablet with, I don't know, four, eight, 24 cores, whatever, it will go even faster without changing the code. Uh, no, the, the way it works is the allocation um, knows, uh, has a type. The type tells you how many elements you have. Okay. And so it will send one element at a time to a different core. Yeah, it just happens that you know they map to by to uh, pixels, but you could do that with a sound, sound processing, like on a sound frame or sample, whatever all you guys do. Uh, 
it really depends on the elements you've described. In the case of the of the, the snowflakes that Chet showed, you know, each yeah, each unit, each data un the processing unit will be a snowflake. Anyway, that's uh, that wraps it up, I think. I think so. Uh, we have yeah. time for questions. Uh, yes, you can have more than one render script because you can create multiple render script context, or you can swap when you bind the root script. Uh, you can swap them, and in this case, I didn't even bind the root script. I just invoke functions on them. Yeah, uh, you can also have you know, scripts that invoke each other or that yeah, include each other. I'll show an example. Hang on a second. Uh, can a render script kernel communicate with another one? Uh, yes, I believe they can invoke. Uh, they can invoke other scripts. So uh, actually, you can't like pass data. Uh, you can pass data as long as it was allocated before. So there, there's a there's an example in the SDK called balls, uh, which um, <coughs> shows balls, uh, and that consists of a couple of scripts. So we can take a look at the project here. So you've got the SDK side here, and then you have these three scripts. You yes. Ah. Oh well, let me show you first the the the, the balls we're talking about. Um, so it's about a thousand. Uh, yeah, particles nine hundred particles that around. react to the accelerometer, and they all interact with each other. So we run nine hundred times nine hundred physics computations on the two cores automatically. It's also interacting with uh, the touch uh, events on the screen. So, okay. Um, so on the left here, you see uh, the three files that are interacting with the scripts on the SDK side, and then on the render script side, you've got. Uh, this is a really tiny one that just declares a couple of uh, data structures that are going to be um, become allocations that get populated in the SDK side. You've got the main script here, uh, which actually does the rendering, um, but then it pawns off the work of actually calculating the physics to a separate script entirely. So it says, okay, well, this script um, is going to be invoked RS for each, so uh, it's going to call the root function of this script from that other script. Um, just like we, we saw in Roman's example, except these are two uh, completely different scripts the interacting. Files these scripts themselves, or are they uh, that header file was um, created. Uh, you would create that. Um, there's standard render script header files that you include just to get handles to the functions. Uh, I also wanted to show some of the generated code. Um, so if we go back to the Droid Flakes example, I can show you some of the data structures that were created um, for. Uh, uh, yeah, gen. Flaky. Flaky was the one. What was that? Uh, it's in Gen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can see, for instance, um, uh, this was created from the Flake data structure, the data structure that basically had the flow to for the position, the speed scale, all these things that you can see. This is uh, the generated code that was created at compile time. So if you call the dot item, um, API inside of this thing, it will return a data structure that's basically an exact mirror of what you created on the render script side. Um, and here's some of the element creation stuff that you don't have to do if you allow render script compilation to do it for you. Um, so uh, it can create the element automatically. This is um, sort of like the code that I walked through on the slides, except it's done for you, right? So it creates this wrapper uh, stuff for you. Um, and then if I call uh, the constructor of script field flake, which is down here, then it'll basically call create element for me. So all I say is, okay, here's the script, here's this constructor that you uh, handily created for me, and here's how many of these flakes I want to create. Um, and uh, then it populates a couple of internal variables and then calls that create element thing that walks through and actually manually creates the element um, and initializes it, and then you get the type and the allocation and everything created for you. Um, I think that was the question about the generated code. This is sort of, I mean, there, there's more stuff in here. Oh, here's one of the set functions um, that so you would call. Yeah, so you can also use the, those generated functions if you need to, to set one element inside the array. There's, there's a method that takes an index and you can modify values from the, the Java side. Uh, you don't have to do it on the render script side. Also on the render script side, you can modify the allocation and if you want to read the result from Java, there's a way to synchronize the data between the two. Uh, so it goes both ways. Um, handy links, uh, Android developer blog, as I said, Jason Sam's two articles and probably a third one sometime soon. Uh, Roman's blog at CuriousCreature.com and my blog at ChatChat.blogspot.com. And it's, it's that org. What? Oh. Amateurs typing up these slides. Honestly, fire these people. All right. CuriousCreature.org.
He has several oh. blogs. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, yeah, this is actually a link to my humor blog, which is entirely different. <laughs> he talks a lot. He also writes a lot. Graphicsgeek.blogspot.com. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this will get you a little bit closer to technical details than the other one would. Uh, that wraps up the talk. We can stick around for some more questions. Um, otherwise, thanks.